Hello everyone, welcome back to Dan Cuts. So today we'll be taking a look at a really interesting problem from a while back, and that is problem number one from the USA MO2019. Now as a problem number one, you may expect this to be a relatively simple problem, but take a look at the form of the equation on the screen. It looks a bit crazy. So without further ado, let us take a look at the problem statement. So as mentioned, this is problem 1 from the USA MO2019, and we actually have a number theory functional equation. That's really interesting. So we are given the following problem. A function f from n to n. So n here is uh, referring to the positive integers, and it satisfies this crazy looking equation here. You apply f for f n number of times, and that is supposed to equal to n squared over f f n. Wow, applying a unknown number of times, a, a variable number of times, that is just difficult to wrap your mind around. So this is also hold for all positive integers n. And more interestingly, we are supposed to just find all possible values of f1000. So it's not finding all uh, feasible f's, it's just finding all possible values of f1000. So there are so many things about this problem that is quite special and different from a standard problem. It's quite intimidating for a problem one to be honest. But we can still try and approach this problem systematically. So as usual, let's take a look at some motivation. Now, a functional equation, what's the first thing you would do? As always, you should try n equals to 1, small cases, and see what you can learn. So let's start by trying n equals 1 and see, can we learn anything about f1? Well, on the right side, you have 1 over f f1. Now, the key observation is that the left side is f of something, so it must be a positive integer. This implies then that f f1 must be equal to 1 because, well, anything else, 1 over that thing will not be a positive integer anymore. Okay, but can we narrow down to what the value of f1 is? Well, of course, there are two possible things that can happen from here. Either f1 is already equals to 1, so uh, of course, then ff1 is equals to 1. Or f1 goes to something else that's not 1, let's call that c, and then f or c brings it back to 1. So 1 gets mapped to c, c gets mapped to 1. Now, can the second scenario happen? Well, the easiest way to get a contradiction is if you sub in n equals to c back to the equation. Now, the right side is very simple, it's just c square, and then c goes to 1, 1 goes back to c, so ffc is just c here. Now, by the left hand side, you might think, well, it's a bit crazy to deal with this uh, applying f a uh, variable number of times, but you do know what is fc, because fc is 1, right, when you sub in c here. So thankfully, this is just applying f one time. So the left side actually turns out to be really simple as well, it's just fc. So fc equals to c, but this is a contradiction because we are assuming that c goes to 1 where c is not equal to 1 itself. So this scenario cannot happen. So we learn that, oh, indeed f1 is equal to 1. That's a good start. Now, uh, I do want to point out that when you first consider whether this scenario is possible, Rather than sub substituting in n equals to c directly, you might be tempted to look at sticking with n equals 1 and see if there's any contradiction. Well, unfortunately, you don't really get a contradiction because when you put in n equals to 1, yeah, okay, the right side is 1, right? So the question is, will the left side be equal to 1 under this scenario? It turns out that it's still possible because 1 goes to c, c goes to 1, and so on. So if fn, which is, uh, if f1, which is c, happens to be even, then 1 goes to c, c goes back to 1, you do get left hand side is equal to 1. So there's no contradiction yet if c is even. Well, so this is a bit unfortunate and you might be stuck uh, over here for a while, but it turns out that this uh, seemingly useless uh, fact over here or seemingly useless derivation over here will play a critical role in our proof. And in fact, you can extend this logic further. Instead of 1 goes to c, c goes to 1, let's take a look at 
the scenario where we have two different numbers, k and m. k goes to m and m gets mapped back to k. So something like this. In the previous slide, we had 1 and c over here. And is it possible for us to have this scenario without getting a contradiction? And we can apply the exact same analysis. If we substitute in k, well, the right hand side is k squared over k, right? Because k goes to m, m goes to k. So the bottom is just k. So k squared over k is k. And the left hand side, it keeps alternating here. So it's either k or m depending on what is the parity of m because you are doing f m times. Now, therefore, if m is even, you do look back to k and there's no contradiction. This uh, equation holds perfectly well. And similarly, if you sub in m, you do get the same uh, conclusion here that there will be no contradiction if k is even. So this tells us that, well, we could pair up numbers and make them work if we pick both numbers to be even. Aha, 1000 here is an even number. That suggests something. So indeed, we can now go into our official solution. First, we show that f1000 can equal any even positive integer k. And the setup is very simple. You make 1000 go to that even number, and we make that even number go back to 1000. And of course, uh, the case where k equals 1000, you can see that it obviously works. And of, for all the other numbers, we are just going to make it fn equals to n. Okay, so everything else fn equals to n other than 1000 and k, which maps to each other. Okay, uh, and as I mentioned, k equals 1000 is an obvious case. You just do fn equals n for everything, it definitely works. So does this work? Well, for sure, if uh, we look at n that is not 1000 or k, the right side is just going to be n squared over n. The left side is just n. So it works. Whereas for uh, 1000, you substitute in right side 1000. Left side, because we are applying f an even number of times, your 1000 goes to k and k will come back to 1000. So again, it works. Same thing if you substitute in n equals to k. Same proof as what we saw in the previous slide. So wonderful. But what about odd integers? Can f1000 be a positive odd integer? Well, this is the second part of the problem that is a bit tricky. First, let's establish some basic observations. So f1 equals to 1, we saw that already. This is something natural that you will want to check uh, for any function equation question. What is the value of f1? Now, the other thing that we will typically check is whether f is injective. And it turns out that f is indeed injective in this case. And the proof follows a very standard approach, which is assuming fk equals to fm, can we show that then k equals to m? In this case, it's very uh, fairly obvious because uh, the terms over here on the left side and in the denominator here, well, if you put in k and if you put in m, they are going to result in the same numbers. So therefore, the numerator here must equal each other. And so very formally, uh, you put in k over here in the equation, k square equals the denominator times left side, which is this expression. fk is same as fm by assumption. You apply f at least one time onto k, so you get the same thing as applying that same number of f on m. And of course, ffk is same as ffm, and this is equals to m squared. So k equals to m, as I uh, alluded to earlier. Okay. Now, the next claim is fn is equals to n for odd n. Okay. How do we prove this? This is another part of the problem that is actually quite tricky. Uh, and it turns out that one of the more reasonable proof is to just use induction. So we do have f1 equals to 1 already. And by induction, uh, how do we apply induction? We suppose fn is equal to n for all the odd n that is less than equal to k minus 2, where k is odd. And we want to show fk is equal to k. This is the tricky part. How do we show this? Okay, we substitute in n equals to k. 
you get k squared equals to this, right? So this is the same as this equation. I just moved the denominator over. And you might be staring at this for a while. The key observation is that k squared is the product to number k is odd. So this must be odd. This must be odd. Now, the numbers individually multiply with k squared, but it turns out that the numbers individually cannot be too small. In fact, it cannot be less than or equal to k minus 2 by injectivity because we already established the induction hypothesis for uh, n less than or equal to k minus 2. And by injectivity, nothing else can map into those small odd numbers, right? k minus 2 can only be mapped in by k minus 2. So if you start off at something that's not k minus 2, you can never end up at k minus 2. So uh, same thing for this factor here. So two odd numbers that are at least k multiply the k square. This forces each of these factors to be equal to k. And this is the key observation. And once you reach this, in particular, ffk equals k, the rest of the proof follows a familiar logic. Namely, let's see what happens if fk is equal to c and then fc is mapped back to k. And we want to show that c is indeed k, which will then give us what we want. And from here, the logic pretty much is very familiar. We put in n equals to c, we get the equation here. FFC is C because of the uh, cycle here. FC by definition is K. So we have this. Now, how do we simplify this? Well, thankfully, C and K loops into each other. So given that K is odd, I'm going to loop C to K, K to C, C to K. And then because K is odd, I'll be applying F one more time. So this is the same as fc. Okay, very good. So now we cancel the factor of c and we conclude that fc is indeed equal to c, but at the same time fc is equal to k, so this is equal to k, and everything works out. So, well, we concluded this proof, uh, I mean this claim, and finally we just put everything together. We can now show that f1000 cannot be an odd k because f of odd k must equal to odd k and f is injective. So 1000 cannot be another number that maps to this odd k. And this finally concludes the proof. So what do you think of this problem? Given that it's problem number one, I think it's a bit crazy, uh, but it is definitely an interesting problem. So I hope you enjoyed the problem a lot and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.